Welcome to part 3 of this video series on air conditioning. This is Piyush Singh and the topic for today's video is psychrometric processes. The first process that we'll be discussing is mixing of air streams, which can occur with and without condensation. Mixing with condensation is avoided in air conditioning systems and hence is rarely observed. In nature, mixing with condensation may be observed in winters and after rains when cold and dry air mixes with hot and humid air causing some dew drops to appear. In case of air conditioning systems, what we observe is mixing without condensation. In this case, air streams combine to form a single air stream on mixing. Here we have two air streams which combine to form a single air stream. Hence, we have two inlets and a single outlet. In case of air conditioning systems, the mixing usually takes place without addition or rejection of heat and moisture. Hence, the process is adiabatic and the total moisture content remains constant throughout the process. Now, due to conservation of mass, the total amount of dry air entering the system remains constant. Also, since there is no addition or rejection of heat, the amount of water content remains constant. M1W1 here gives the amount of water vapor that is entering at inlet 1 and M2W2 gives us the amount of water vapor that is entering at inlet 2. Since M2 is the mass of dry air and W2 is the, mass, is the specific humidity. Now, since there is no addition of moisture here, the total moisture content at the outlet is, is equal to that at the inlet. Similarly, from energy balance, what we observe is, since the process is adiabatic, the total heat content in the system remains constant. Now, let us rearrange these equations and find the ratio between M1 and M2 in terms of specific humidity and specific enthalpy. Now, this figure here shows us the mixing process on the psychrometric chart. 1 and 2 are the inlets and 3 is the outlet condition. What we observe is that 3 lies on a line connecting the inlet points. Now, if we rearrange the equations, we can arrive at these two equations. From this, the ratio M1 upon M2 is given by these quantities. Now, what we observe from this is that the ratio of the distance distances on this line that is 1 is 1 to 3 and 2 to 3 or 3 to 2 is equal to the ratio between the mass flow rates so the higher the mass flow rate at, at a given inlet the in the outlet point is closer to that inlet point so this is how the process is represented on the psychrometric chart as we discussed earlier the outlet point lies closer to the inlet point where the mass flow rate is higher the second process that we'll be discussing is sensible heating. Now, if we have a heating coil, which may be an electrical heating element or a steam coil, which is at a temperature higher than the dry bulb temperature of incoming air, there will be net heat transfer from the coil to the incoming air. And what we get at the outlet is air at a higher dry bulb temperature. But since there is no moisture addition here, or there is no dehumidification, the total moisture content remains same at the outlet so when air passes over this dry surface there is a net change in the dry bulb temperature of the air and since it is a heating element there is a net increase in dry bulb temperature this process is by a horizontal line on the psychrometric chart since there is no change in the moisture content and hence the specific humidity remains constant if we talk about the relative humidity it increases with increase in dry bulb temperature. Also, there is a net increase in the specific enthalpy of the air. Now, as we can see here, the incoming air is at condition 1. The outlet condition is 2 and the coil surface temperature is at condition 3. Now, ideally, the air will come in contact with the coil and should reach the coil surface temperature. But in practice, this is not observed and the outlet temperature is somewhat between 1 and 3. Now the quantity that measures this is called bypass factor. Now let us understand this with an example. Say we have an examination of total marks 100 and student A scores 80 out of 100 and student B scores 90 out of 100. Now student A wished to score 100 but could achieve only 80. So what he could not achieve is 20 marks. Similarly, student B could not achieve 10 marks. So the bypass factor for student A would be 20 upon 100. What he could not achieve divided by what was the total desired marks. So it is 0 
in case of student B it will be 0 0.1. So, in this case the total change in temperature that was desired was difference between T dB 3 and T dB 1 that is the denominator and what could not be achieved was T dB 3 minus T dB 2. So, this ratio gives us the bypass factor. Now, if we observe the system, the bypass factor is a function of the coil design. So, higher the number of coils, smaller is the bypass factor and higher the velocity of air, higher is the bypass factor. Now, the total heat added to the system is a difference in enthalpy between the outlet and the inlet which is equal to the specific heat into change in temperature. Now, CPM is the specific heat of humid air which is usually taken to be 1.022 kilojoule per kg Kelvin. Here is an expression for the sensible heat added per minute. Similar to sensible heating, we have sensible cooling process in which the coil temperature is lower than the dry bulb temperature of the incoming air, but it should be higher than the dew point temperature of the incoming air. This is to avoid condensation. During sensible cooling process, the total moisture content remains constant similar to the sensible heating process. And so, on the psychrometric chart, it is represented as a horizontal line but moving in the opposite direction. In this case, the relative humidity increases and the dry bulb temperature decreases. Also, there is a drop in the specific enthalpy. Similar to the sensible heating process, this process also has a bypass factor. The next process for discussion is cooling and dehumidification. In this case, the required condition is that the coil temperature should be at a temperature lower than the dew point temperature of the incoming air. So, when the air passes over this surface, which is at a temperature lower than its dew point temperature, condensation and sensible cooling occur simultaneously. So, on the psychrometric chart, this process is represented by a line connecting the apparatus dew point and the initial condition and the final condition lies in between these two points. In actual practice, this may not be a straight line, but for the simplicity of calculations, this is assumed to be a straight line. So, let us see what are the characteristics of this process. In this process, some condensation will take place. So, there will be a net drop in moisture content of the incoming air. Hence, we will observe a drop in the specific humidity. Also, there is a drop in the dry bulb temperature. In this case, since we are approaching the saturation line, the relative humidity increases. Also, there is a drop in the specific enthalpy. Now, let us consider the mass balance for this process. Now, M1 W1 is the amount of water vapor it is entering, M4 W4 is the condition at the outlet and MW is the amount of condensation that is taking place. Now, if you consider the energy balance, what we have is M1 H1 is the enthalpy of air entering the system. TH is the total enthalpy drop during the process. MW HW is the enthalpy of water that is removed from the air and M4 H4 is the final enthalpy of the outgoing air. Now, if we rearrange this, these terms, what we get is the total enthalpy is equal to M1 into H1 minus H4, which can ag again be rearranged in this form. Now, 1 to 1 dash is a dehumidification process, whereas 1 dash to 4 is sensible cooling. So, the total heat can be rearranged into two components, that is the sensible heat and the latent heat. So, total heat is equal to the latent heat plus sensible heat. Now, the ratio of the sensible heat and the total heat is called sensible heat factor or sensible heat ratio. This is the expression for the sensible heat factor. The next process that we will be discussing is heating and humidification. Now, for heating and humidification to take place, in addition to a heating coil, we may require addition of some moisture. This may be in the form of 
a water spray or steam. So in this case, there is a rise in the drybulb temperature and also there is a rise in the specific humidity. Now if you consider the mass balance for the control volume, what we get is the mass of water that is added is equal to the mass of water vapor at the outlet minus mass of water vapor at the inlet. Now let us try and form the energy balance where QH is the heat supplied by the heating coil, H1 and H2 are the enthalpies at the inlet and outlet and HW is the enthalpy of steam added. So what do you get? I hope you also got this expression here. QH is equal to M1 H2 minus H1 minus MW HW. Now QH is the total heat supplied. M1 into H2 gives us the enthalpy at the outlet. M1 H1 gives us the enthalpy at the inlet and MW HW gives us the enthalpy added due to the water that is added to the air. So the total heat supplied by the heating coil is given by this expression here. The next process that we will be discussing is cooling and humidification. In this case, a spray of water is added to the incoming air. The water temperature should be lower than the dry bulb temperature of the incoming air, but it should be higher than the dew point temperature. During this process, there is sensible heat transfer from air to water and latent heat transfer from water to air. Hence, the total heat transfer depends upon the water temperature. Seeing this, there can be three possibilities. Now, the first condition is the water temperature lies between the dew point temperature and the wet bulb temperature of the incoming air. In this case, cooling and humidification will take place. The sensible heat transfer is from air to water. but the latent heat transfer is from water to air. Thus, the total heat transfer is from air to water. So, there is a drop in enthalpy of the air and hence it is represented by a line which lies below the constant enthalpy line on the psychrometric chart. The second case is when the water temperature is equal to the wet bulb temperature. In this case, adiabatic saturation takes place. The sensible heat transfer from air to water is exactly equal to the latent heat transfer from water to air. This process is represented on the psychrometric chart along the constant enthalpy line. The third case is when the water temperature lies between the wet bulb temperature and dry bulb temperature of the incoming air. In this case, cooling and humidification takes place, but the sensible heat transfer is from air to water. The latent heat transfer is from water to air. The net heat transfer is from water to air. Hence, in this case, the enthalpy of the air increases and it lies above the constant enthalpy line. Now, the performance of a humidifying apparatus is given by saturating or humidifying efficiency. The expression for this is given here. Now, what we have here is TdB1 is the temperature of the incoming air. TdB2 is the temperature of the outlet condition and TdB3 is the temperature at saturation. So, the total desired drop in temperature was TdB1 minus TdB3 but what could be achieved was TdB1 minus TdB2 hence the saturation efficiency is given by the ratio of this into 100. The next process we will be discussing is heating and humidification. In this case the air is passed through a hygroscopic material which may be a solid absorbent or a liquid absorbent spray. Due to this process simultaneous heating and dehumidification occurs. If the system is thermally insulated then the enthalpy of air remains constant. Temperature of air increases as its moisture content decreases. On the psychrometric chart this is represented as shown here. If these were the only energies involved the process would be the inverse of adiabatic saturation. However the absorption of water by hygroscopic material is exothermic reaction. Hence there is an increase in enthalpy. But for all numerical calculation this process is assumed to be a constant enthalpy process unless otherwise mentioned. The next process that we will be discussing is adiabatic saturation. Now this adiabatic saturation process is carried out by passing the incoming air over a long sheet of water in an insulated chamber. At the outlet of this chamber the air comes out in saturated condition. Now when this air passes over this long sheet of water this evaporation and specific humidity of air increases. Temperature drop occurs in both air and water. This process will continue until energy transferred from air to water 
is equal to the energy transferred to vaporize the water. At this point, a thermal equilibrium is established between the air, water vapor and water and the air gets saturated. This temperature at which the equilibrium takes place is called the adiabatic saturation temperature or the thermodynamic wet bulb temperature. Now, if we consider the process to be a steady state process and we neglect the changes in kinetic and potential energies, this is what we arrive at. H1 is the enthalpy of the incoming air, W2S is the amount of water vapor at saturation, W1 is the amount of water vapor at condition 1 and HW is the enthalpy of water. Now this is equal to H2 that is the condition at the outlet. This quantity here W2S minus W1 into HW is usually neglected as it is a very small quantity and hence during adiabatic saturation it is assumed that the process is isenthalpic but in practice this is not the case. Now this term here H1 minus W1 HW which can be generally expressed as HX minus WX HX is sigma heat function. Now the sigma heat function is a constant for a given wet bulb temperature. It is a difference between the actual enthalpy and the enthalpy obtained by following constant wet bulb temperature and this small correction term enthalpy deviation. Processes let us review the uh, process that we have discussed. Now please try and name these processes as they appear. So the process 1 to 2 is sensible heating. Process 1 to 3 is sensible cooling. 1 to 4 is humidification. 1 to 5 is dehumidification, 1 to 6 is cooling and dehumidification, 1 to 7 is heating and humidification, 1 to 8 is cooling and humidification, 1 to 9 is heating and humidification. Also let us try and answer a few questions to see how much we recall from the contents of the video. Now the first question is during sensible heating the humidity ratio remains unchanged. Is it true or false? Now this is true because during sensible heating there is no addition or removal of moisture. Now the humidity ratio is nothing but the specific humidity. So it remains unchanged. Air undergoing sensible heating the wet bulb depression decreases. This is false. Just look at the psychometric chart and try and see if this is, this is correct or not. The vapor pressure during sensible heating of moisture increases. This is false. During sensible cooling, wet bulb temperature decreases. True. During sensible heating of moisture, enthalpy decreases. This is false. Now here we have two conditions. In these two conditions, what we have is the velocity of air in the first case that is A, V1 is greater than the velocity in the second case that is V2. So you have to tell in which case the bypass factor would be higher. The answer is A and the reason for this is and the reason for this is that since the velocity is higher, therefore the time available for contact with the coil is lesser and hence the bypass factor will be higher in case of the first coil. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to the channel to help it grow and also press the bell icon for all the notifications of new videos.